audio as well, so it happens. Yikes, we're about to go live any second. Greetings, welcome to the Saroth the Mage Experiment. Tonight I have a, a wonderful guest, Luxa Strata, who I hope has got audio at the moment. Do you have audio, Luxa? Thumbs up. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank God for that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> multi-talented uh, woman. Uh, you've got your Lux Occult podcast. You're a visual artist. You're a, a perhaps not a founder, but a lead organizer in the Green Mushroom Project. And you've also got a new album of uh, oral erotica, but it's AU, oral erotica <laughs> album coming out. So, you know, I think that's why you had to put in your little intro there in brackets, uh, meaning sound. <laughs> the uh, the wordplay isn't quite as funny when it's not read when it's not read. So yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, so just before I start, uh, Luxa Strata, because we're going to talk about some sensitive and personal issues, maybe. Do you consent to this interview? Well, you know, consent is typically informed, and since you haven't sent me a list of questions that you're going oh, to ask, I'm just okay, okay <laughs> reserve reserve your consent for now. But I, I, uh, no, I, I'm looking forward to uh, to talking about all this stuff. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Groovy. So uh, it's a it's a kind of standard first question, but how, and more importantly, why did you get into magic, Luxa? Well. I think that the way that I was raised, it was all just always sort of a part of my life. I'm not sure if it's ever something that I intentionally got into so much as I sort of like wandered over to it as a means of making sense of things that I was already sort of experiencing. Okay, if that makes so your, sense. Your parents were occulty? Occult adjacent. I would say my mom especially was she doesn't refer to herself in this manner, but I would say that she definitely is. I mean, I was taught about things, adjacent concepts to things like thought forms, lucid dreaming, wow. all that kind of stuff at a pretty young age. So yeah, you tell I me. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Because one of the things I was going to talk to you about um, is a lot of American guests and American shows in Britain, it's very secular. You know, most native Britons are never go to church. church religion just isn't in the picture. But yet in America, there's there's areas where it's people are brought up in intensely religious um, families. You know, the the traditional fundamentalist kind of stuff is is amazingly still on the go. So that has a big effect on their their future development as occultists or whatever. Um, yeah. I, I don't think that's a question. That's more of a statement. So <laughs> well, I definitely me. agree with you there. I mean, yeah. as Americans, we can never really fully escape our puritanical roots. I mean, this country was in many ways founded by people. Our fanatics. Were, yeah, our a little bit too, like, a little too much. And, and England was like, why don't you guys go over there? And you can have your own, you can do all that over there away from us. And so I yeah. think that's kind of where we're always coming from. And it's, that still iterates in many areas of our society. It really does. You know, yeah. I, I thought, like, uh, from my British British perspective, like the summer of love and the hippies and, and all that kind of stuff would just mean that religion would just kind of go away. But it's it's some some ways the more it, I think it knows it's dying and in, in a way, or I don't know, is it? But it's like a, I don't know, especially with Trump and stuff. I don't want to get too political. But it seemed to all uh, flourish again, you know, like a reactionary movement. Sure. I mean, I think that, I mean, just as humans, when we look at history and we look at anthropology and stuff, this is a thing that we have in pretty much, well, actually every culture. Like, so it Absolutely. seems like there's this, you know, psychological infrastructure that is present in all of us and we make use of it in different ways. And sometimes if we're not, the ones who are in the driver's seat in terms of like how that's playing out for us, it's very easy to be swept up in somebody else's narrative and have that um, feed into what they're doing, which I think might be the case with Trump. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. So with your magical worldview, oh, it's, sorry, tell me a bit about the Green Mushroom Project uh, sure. before we oh, go yeah. on to broader topics. Sure. So you were correct, actually. I was one of the founding people, and this is actually... Um, something that came to me as 
something that I needed to do. And I was able to find some help from people early on. And um, yeah, so this is a large scale ongoing group working that we started around. Well, actually, we started it on Halloween in 2020. We planned for a while before that. But um, let me see here. I could probably explain the sort of metaphor of the project first and might make it a little bit easier. So cool. conceptualize the project as being a hypho sigil, hypho, you know, referring to web. So this is kind of similar to like people might have heard of concepts like the linking sigil or whatever. So this is a sigil that's supposed to link together and form this magical web, like fungal hyphae, right? <laughs> so the, the metaphor here is that there are certain members of uh, Basidiomycota, which is the family of fungi that make mushrooms, that have these like mutual symbiotic relationships with certain tree um, species. And so you'll have these forests that are connected underground through their mutualistic relationship with these fungi. So we kind of like to think about the project as being like this web of mycelial magical hyphae that connects us, yeah. the practitioners who are- A the rhizomatic species. structure. Yes. So as I was saying, it kind of connects us and strengthens us and you know allows us to communicate and all that stuff. So it's kind of a, it's a biological metaphor in that way. Um, yeah. So yeah, Love this that. is something, yeah, and it comes out as a like a, a, a fanzine. Uh, people contribute p poetry and and uh, rituals and art and stuff. I uh, yes, we've most recently. That, that's one of our most recent projects that we've put out there is a zine. Uh, we're calling it "Fuck Around and Find Out: Offerings <laughs> of Magical Sovereignty from the Green Mushroom Project," and that's actually available for free digital download right now. We're working on getting printed copies manufactured now. But yeah, so but this is just one of uh, many very cool things that we've been able to kind of come together and do. We have a group chat every Friday where we kind of like just hang out, shoot the shit, talk about our practices, our work with the project. And then we have some kind of like, you know, just simple magical rituals that we do every Friday. We also have, you know, uh, special rituals that we run. There's clubs and everything. We have a, a Discord server where we're organizing all this stuff and so yeah, there's a ton of stuff going on. And if anybody is interested in getting involved, I will definitely give Stevie a link to that. So yeah. Oh, uh, all the links will be posted below the video, uh, like the consummate professional I am. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get on to the subject of the show, the thing that everybody's been waiting for, talking about sex magic because even as a 53 year old veteran of all forms of uh, existence it's still a little bit embarrassing to talk about sex and I was thinking even in my magical diaries I would take you know the minutest detail that if it involved a sex act it would be like a initial or a squiggle or you know because oh people can't what if someone read it <laughs> they might know I had a dirty thought. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's interesting. So I'm kind of curious, like, why do you think that is the case for you? Um, I think I copied it a bit off Crowley, you know, it was a bit like, this is how magicians do it. Uh, you use codes for special operations. And I don't know, you know, Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland, we're talking about like, uh, how your geographical place can affect your attitude as you grow up. It's a very, um, you know, Glasgow and all them are like a lot of Catholics, Glasgow especially, and they're very outgoing and exuberant. But in Aberdeen, uh, the northeast of Scotland was a lot of uh, like hard Protestant free church of Scotland. Um, you know, really hardline Protestant sex that pleasure was unthinkable to, to talk about anyway. So maybe a bit of that's rubbed off on me, you know. Although I do like to think of myself as sexually liberated and all that, um, the very fact that I couldn't actually write what I did sexually in a book throws up an interesting point. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, so this is a huge topic, right? Um, just kind of off the top of the you know, off the bat, like sexuality, it's a huge part of any organism's life that reproduces sexually. It's definitely like a major Absolutely. evolutionary drive. So it's taking up a lot of space in our minds, right? Um, so this is just one of the reasons that sex magic can be a 
um, powerful thing to work with. But I think that the thing that you mentioned is also a really interesting aspect of it. And that's one of the things that I explore a lot in my work. You mentioned this sort of like this feeling of, you know, maybe a little bit of tension, you know, this kind of like you're writing in your own private journal that most likely nobody is ever going to read, right? Like, I don't think I'm interesting enough where people would want to read. Like, I can barely stand reading it, right? Like, who would, well, I'd but, never but read still. mine. There's no point in keeping it because I never look back. Same as these videos, I never watch my videos back because sure but there's still something going on there like where we feel this there's this tension right this tension yeah. within us and i think like working with that even on its own can be something that has a lot of magical potential absolutely like um you know i've been reading through lieber null and psychonaut again it's listing the various forms of gnosis and uh, one of them is kind of uh you know taboo breaking or feeling like you're doing something a little bit, you know, it just a, a peak experience, you know, yeah, a peak experience is, you know, maybe a taboo sexual act, as long as it's with consenting adult partners. But there is a lot of power and, and you know, I, without getting too personal, I explored a lot of that side of my own sexuality in my last relationship, and it's really opened up my eyes to what sex magic actually means. I don't think I really knew before. It was like, what, do we just masturbate on a sigil and that, like, <laughs> gives it superpower? <laughs> yeah, no, it's very interesting. So you mentioned um, the stuff from Lieber MMN, this idea of, like, breaking taboo and everything. Absolutely. These are concepts that come from, you know, older traditions, like some of the tantric traditions have this idea of, like, you know, these forbidden things. Um ritually breaking these taboos as a way of I guess maybe I'm having a hard time kind of explaining it, but maybe as it yeah. towards the means of like liberating oneself from these um notions yeah. that are inherent in these taboos so I think you know when we look at these older traditions like as modern people and as westerners and stuff it's important to sort of recontextualize like well what does that mean for me I'm not from a society where you know eating or not from a culture where eating like meat or fish or, or drinking wine is really like prohibited. That's actually very encouraged by, <laughs> by our culture in a lot of ways. So, you know, but what were the, what would those things look like for me? Um, what would those taboos look like in my context? And what would that mean to break them and things like that? So I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff there, you know, as long as it's done, as you said, consensually and with intent, then yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, I'm thinking about the embodied, you know, I think Western magicians uh, tend to spend a lot of time kind of in their heads and, and floating about astral projecting. And it's all about kind of getting out of the body, almost the Gnostic idea that the body is like a prison and uh, we want to get out and like be up in the sky. Uh, but the real magical power and, you know, Denny Sargent has a great, uh, book out at the moment actually werewolf magic and then werewolf bat magic and obviously it's not about turning into a big hairy werewolf it's enjoying the embodiment and acknowledging that you you're not a, a soul and a mind and a trapped in a body that you're a holistic system uh much like the the mushroom mycelium stuff and funnily enough a lot of this is revealed on um magic mushroom psychedelics Yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So do you, I mean, when I first saw the Green Mushroom Project, I thought it was like, oh, this has got to be all about psychedelics. Do psychedelics play a role in your magical journey? Um, there's something that I have learned from a lot in the past, especially when I was younger. I definitely did a lot of, you know, work with them. It was something that I always did contextualize as being a sort of like spiritual journey. I got into like Absolutely. Carlos Castaneda when I was like in high school. Oh, and so, so there was, like, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of like, I was definitely influenced by a lot of that, but I think, you know, we can say what we want about him and his stuff, but like there was a, there was definitely the idea of like using these experiences as a means of like yeah. learning something in this wilderness and being able to take it back to your normal everyday life. And so that's yeah. always, so I, I sort of approached it in that manner. And um, yeah, it's not, 
psychedelics aren't like a huge part of my practice. I know other people who find a lot of uh, value in exploring that and everything. I think for me personally, I feel that I've mostly gotten the sense that I've learned what I could. And if it's like, I really, really get the urge to like yeah. explore that again, I will sometimes, but it's not something that is no, in the forefront of my it's, practice. It's, or anything it's, like it's that. not something that you need to repeat over and over and over and over again. I didn't. Although I do do like four times a year at the equinoxes and the solstice. That's a, that's a little uh, kind of devotional thing. Is, do you have a devotional aspect uh, in your work? What's that like? Yeah. Uh, a prime deity? Yes. I, uh, devotional work is actually a big part of my practice and a big part of my sex magic practice. Um, both of the albums that I've released are actually done within the context of doing these daily devotional rituals and recording them and building these tracks out of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, working with the idea of the divine feminine and like how this can be recontextualized, I went through a lot of different like exploratory phases with that. The person who I've been working or person, I don't know, person is the right word. It feels like a person, but the, the deity <laughs> I've been working with the most um, has been Hikate for about oh, yeah. the last year and a half or so. And that's been a pretty intense and also like a very rewarding relationship that I'm really enjoying. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I was doing, uh, Hikate seemed to just um, like, a, she just burst out up from the, the popular imagination of a cultist. You know, did you notice that you should get the odd mention and then all of a sudden she was everywhere. Uh, she manifested. I used to do uh, deep, deep non, you know, dark moon. Mm -hmm. There's a Catholic church right over the road there. And I used to uh, make a little platter and put out like wine and milk and whatever I could find suitable and put it over on a plate and probably like wo wolves, I was about to say, foxes. We don't have wolves in Scotland. Yeah, probably there. And it was very rewarding. And one, it's one of the few times I've actually felt a presence in the room and it was just one of the times i'd done it afterwards probably said a, a prayer or something and it felt totally like there was you know it's like some you know when somebody's standing behind you and of course when i looked around there was nobody there but that was that was wild yeah, yeah. she comes through like in my experience she's she'll show up she's quite reliable <laughs> and yeah, showing up is, is <laughs> what more could you really want right <laughs> I think that's one of our uh, names or acknowledged attributes is she always comes. And I also live at a three-way crossroads here. So it's kind of a nice place for uh, Hecate magic. That's so, very cool. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Hecate, sex magic, how, how do you use sex to empower rituals without going into any, you know, any broad strokes whatever you're comfortable with but oh man okay well this is uh, gosh i mean are you asking me personally or just how does one do it because well, i mean there's all kinds of different ways that you can go about yeah. this it's a very rich topic yeah well just dive in at any point that you feel comfortable okay because it's I, I still don't use much uh, how do you do sex magic <laughs> how do you do it <laughs> that's what i want to know <laughs> although all i've right. got an inkling is it something to do with that um, liminal zone, uh, extremely stimulated, but not spent, you know, that uh, edging, you could call it. I think that's a... Sure. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people work with edging on the idea of getting to know yourself really well, getting a really good handle on how your body works and what those sort of like, um, I don't know, levels look like for you in terms of where you're going to jump off and where you're going to keep going and, and all that stuff getting to know yourself is definitely i think and the sort of meditative work that accompanies that can be a big part of the pro uh, practice for sure mm -hmm. in terms of like you you mentioned something earlier like do we just masturbate on sigils like, <laughs> this is definitely i think worth addressing because this is what all the people make memes about when they talk about yeah. chaos well magic. there it is it's a chaos magic <laughs> yes let's let's talk about it um so this is the idea with this is that when you experience an orgasm, it's a type of gnosis, as you mentioned, like the idea that during this kind of like 
moment when your brain is sort of overstimulated or short circuiting or however you want to feel about it or however you want to describe it, there's this sort of um, maybe crack that opens up in your consciousness. And through that little crack, you can like slip something in. And so this is the idea behind um, what some people consider to be like traditional uh, sigil magic for chaos magic. So the idea is that um, at this moment, you clear your mind of everything else that's going on and you just think of the sigil or whatever form this symbol is taking, the semiotic representation of your will. And then it's over and it's already done. So that's like the really kind of um, the way that a lot of people, when they make these silly memes and talk about this stuff on the yeah. internet, this is this is what they're thinking about. But it's a much, much more interesting and broad oh, yeah. topic. It's, it can it's, be used it's for much to be honest, I've used sigils for years and it, 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 I was making a joke there. It is a, a much more um, considered and, and, you know, you don't just scribble and then there has to be uh, magic in it or it wouldn't work. Um, yeah, so uh, how else? How else do we use sex and magic? So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different ways. Mm. Um, Tell me them all. I wish I could, you know, honestly, I wish there was a book out there that had everything that we all could want. That's <laughs> because it, because magic is such an individual practice and because sex is so individual, when you combine those things together, I think it orders of magnitude may be more personal than, than either of those things combined, possibly, depending of course on who you ask. But <laughs> so I can speak to my own perspective. I can't speak for everybody out there or anything like that, but um, for, me something that's coming to mind is the idea of using sexual energy as a means of empowering other things in your life um so this is a different sort of way of looking at sex magic where you're not actually you know having sex or you're using this sexual energy in, in a way that oh, you're yeah. for focusing it in other areas yeah um, yeah so, so you could build it up by abstention from sex which is probably what uh you know, vows of chastity and uh, celibacy and monks and all that kind of stuff. That's where that comes from. It's redirecting that sexual energy. Yeah, possibly, yeah. I mean, and I'm not sure if celibacy always has to be a part of it. I don't. I think it really depends on the person and their body and their physiology. I think that there are a lot of people that do get a lot of bang for their buck out of celibacy. I've talked to other people that the other way is the case where it's sort of more of like a fire that you stoke and it gets bigger and bigger. It just really depends on the person and what you got going on. But the idea is here that you can, so for me, like I like to think about it as like broadening this idea of sexuality and what makes me excited. Like, um, you know, I'm a sort of a very naturally sexual person. So this is something that I like to work with as instead of it being as potentially yeah. could be the case problematic. How do we redirect this stuff and make it useful to us as magicians? Yeah. This is what we the work game is, with, right? We work with the tools that we have, obviously. Yes, absolutely. We don't get to choose the hand we're dealt, only how we play mm -hmm. it. So for me, like a lot of this, the idea of, of using this energy in other ways and using it in intentional ways, like in my creative work and stuff like that, if that makes sense, like building up this, as you said, this sort of like reserve and focusing it towards something. This is, you know, a lot of people will point out that like sexual energy is by definition, creative energy. It's about yeah, making more people, I guess, like in a sort of evolutionary sense. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of creative potential for it there. Another aspect that I think a lot of people do you find uh, useful for sex magic and you know using sex in their practice is that it can be really useful for accessing states where you're very you know receptive so divination can be very oh yeah beneficial like in those types of contexts as well so this is something that i've played a lot with you know especially in making my audio work and stuff like one of the reasons i began recording these ritual sessions was that i wanted to capture all of the weird things that were coming out of my mouth so I, <laughs> yeah. I would go into these altered states and i would just start sort of describing what i was like seeing and thinking and stuff and uh, there needed to be some way to document that yeah. so I, I love um recording uh, magical work and creative work um 
it, it, it's almost like you're dragging an artifact back from that other, um, the astral plane or something. Um, I love magic informing music, painting, poetry, because it, it does it. The art, the artist that drew, drew me towards magic, because I came from a kind of arty, literary background, and I started to say, oh, all these guys that are in a cult are really the best. They're the best. How come? <laughs> and it's that's probably why the the you know the imagination, the sex drive. I was also thinking about um, imprint vulnerability. You know that idea of. Um, Leary, I, I, I bring it up every single show. Uh, Leary and Wilson eight circuit brain model, where you 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 know you're randomly imprinted in Western society because we don't have uh, like coming of age rituals. So you know you imprint uh, various social, sexual, human um, characteristics as you're going along, and magic is a great way of going in as our psychedelics, I believe, going in and kind of resetting um, negative imprints that you've picked up. You know, like they say, as a baby, if you weren't talked with and, uh, you know, the human brain is so complex. But I do like the idea that in the moment of orgasm or satori or the peak of any experience, you can somehow go into your brain and re-imprint a better uh, that's to me how magic works in an evolutionary way you know yeah i love that you brought that up to this idea of what some people might contextualize as reprogramming yeah absolutely. and I, this is kind of circling back to like what we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation when i asked like why do you think you feel so weird about writing <laughs> in that book right yeah. and i that think that was this... a few years ago <laughs> But still, I think that this is a huge this is a huge thing for me in my work. Um, the idea of dissolving shame, of confronting trauma, and you know, trying to sort of like rework how our context, like how our our points of view are on these things. Um, so the there's this idea, right, that trauma is stored in the body. There's a great book about this called "The Body Keeps the Score" by Bessel van der Kolk, and so a big part of, of this work that I've been talking about was that as well as doing this body work. You mentioned that occultists so often we get into this kind of really cerebral place where we're off in, in the clouds and, you know, and that's not necessarily like, as you said, a holistic way of, of confronting things. And so doing this kind of body work and, you know, really getting into like the, I guess the nitty gritty of it and really sort of like, retracing these steps in a very like physical way can be a really really powerful way of making major changes for sure yeah absolutely it, it brings to mind um the physical actions that we do in in you know like your standard banishing ritual there's the physicality of drawing the pentagrams moving around you, you know there's signs grade signs and all that kind of stuff and it's really like a a dance and for my generation uh in the late 80s early 90s there was the rave explosion in britain ecstasy mdma um i used to be a raver too <laughs> yeah and it wasn't it a fantastic experience so many people that were normally you know youth culture in britain had been a bit uptight and a bit sort of aggro these guys don't like those guys but when mdma hit Everybody was dancing together and having a beautiful <laughs> tribal time, you know. It was like that. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, I guess that MDMA was originally developed as like a psychiatric drug for couples yeah. counseling, I want to say, if yeah, I remember it was. correctly. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so. I believe it was. And it's gone going back that way as well. They're, they're starting to use... Um, Ketamine, MDMA, you know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in uh, pharmacos, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So what's my next question? You tell me, Lux Estrata. What should what's I ask you next? <laughs> hmm. Why don't you ask me about the process that went into making my most recent album? <laughs> 
Look, so what was the process that went into making your most recent album? Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Steve. I can't no wait way. to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so like the first one that I made, this was made using like a recursive feedback loop kind of a thing. So I would record these tracks and then as I was recording more tracks, I would listen to what I had already. So there's this sort of idea of like building up complexity that's happening here. So was this on uh, like vocalize stuff or, you know, cause there's like synthesizers and stuff in there as well. What came first, the vocalizations? The vocalized stuff comes first. I usually do about like maybe three or four layers of that. And then it starts to take on a sort of a character that I'll mix music to, um, you know, produce the music and put it in there. And then once that's in there, depending on what stage the track is at is what I will listen to. Yeah, it's very good. What kind of uh, uh, music software do you use for that? Cause I'm gonna have to start learning this stuff, man. So this is kind of embarrassing. I'm not, I, honestly, I I sort of hesitate to call the thing I put out there music. I'm oh, not come like, on. I'm not musically trained. I'm not um, educated in it in any way. This is something I just sort of like. Have uh, you ever heard together. of punk rock? It's, it's, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> if I guess if punk rock is music, then this can be music as well. So it's very much like buck, duck, duct tape and bubble gum. I used okay. Audacity to make all of this just um, I found a lot of samples that I liked. I found a lot of, you know, I, I added my own recordings in there, doing some heavy processing with the Audacity software. Yeah. I was able to just make these weird sound collages that, honestly, like when I kind of think about how this happens, it's there's kind of like this fog. I'm not. I'm sure that other people who are creatives have this as well, where it's I was like, I know say I was the doing creative something. Fog, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's this creative fog, and then you and whatever you're making emerge from it, and you're not a hundred percent sure what happened in between, but it's working. That's so the, it's okay. that is the magic in the magic <laughs> of uh, because I just got this uh, looper pedal, and I can barely play guitar. I, I know about six chords, but um, one morning I woke up and I, I just happened to press it, and this weird sound collage um just was there and i had no idea how it got there <laughs> and it was like the best thing i've ever done i love yeah. that yeah caught up method in it really it's just like uh that's another thing i like about magic is um seeing meaning in um breaking things up and rearranging them and it somehow shows that everything's connected and everything is meaningful. Yeah, absolutely. Take, I'm thinking take, of simplistic yeah. use and all the cut-ups. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you doing a, a video and some music for the next Haunt Winox, which I believe is in uh, April or something, isn't it scheduled for? Most likely. I haven't yeah. gotten that together yet, but I I would I had enjoyed participating last time and so I would I would love to do it again if it works out. You have to. It's the Woodstock of our of our uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, haunt on. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so okay. actually speaking of haunting, let me tell you about another aspect of this project with which a lot of people have been interested in. So okay. um through this kind of process of making these tracks, these very complicated um, I mean, maybe not like musically complicated, but like sort of esoterically complicated in terms of like yeah. how many layers of ritual and all these other stuff that went into him. And this had been the case with the previous album as well, but I definitely felt like there was this kind of like emergent intelligence or whatever you want to call it as part of this project. You know, each Absolutely. each thing we create has its sort of like spirit, right? Yeah. And so this one, it really felt to me like it wanted to find ways to be expressed and to manifest in these like more concrete ways. And so I decided after meditating on it for a while that what I would do was to design a sound magic track, which was specifically for the purpose of allowing the spirit of this project uh -huh. to haunt and inhabit physical items. So I found a couple of different items that I thought would be good contenders. Both of them were products which already had like musical interfaces with, you know, involved in them. So I thought, you know, I could play this, magic track through these things play them play it to these things 
and through that allow the spirit to sort of inhabit them. And it actually has been very interesting. Um, it's been a very interesting experiment. So the first yeah. thing I tried out was with a, um, a vibrator. And oh, this is, so, the, <laughs> so this <laughs> actually is a product that, you know, you can, through the application that it is, comes with it, you can play music through it. it like it'll play yeah. the music. And so, like a didgeridoo, I'd imagine. It's just like a didgeridoo. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I, I ran a couple of, you know, tests with this thing, just sort of like establish a baseline before I initialize this process of haunting it. And I definitely found that there was a huge difference between, you know, the sort of baseline before doing these rituals and then what happened afterwards, which is very, very interesting and unexpected. Yeah. This went so well that I decided to try it on another thing, something that I could kind of carry around with me and hang out with in a, in a way that was like less, I mean, yeah, pe some people I'm sure carry around their vibrators and like hang out with them. Like, <laughs> hey, what's up, buddy? Like, that's that's yeah. not really what my life is like, but that, <laughs> that's what your life was like. That's awesome. But um, so I wanted to try this with another item. And so what I came up with was this children's toy called a Rizmo which actually I have it right here. This is what my friends sometimes uh, jokingly refer to as a ratchet Furby. Oh it's my a, God, it's got what a, is that? It's, it's a Rizmo. And so this is a children's toy, which is um, musical. It's musically themed. It starts out as like a little ball and you kind of <laughs> interact with it and play it music and stuff. And it unfolds wow. into this oh, little it. creature. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's see if, uh, See if it's turned on here. Give us a song. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting. Oh, cute. Uh, yeah, there. You know that uh, concept of Burroughs and guys in the third mind. So whenever you're working, but I found that because of modern technology, you can work with yourself. And bounce ideas off the other the person that recorded that bit two days ago is not the person that's playing guitar on the top of it two days later although that they're all you technically we change constantly especially through magic and art yeah absolutely i love that idea of finding the third mind within the yeah. many selves that's very without, cool yeah without, it just it just came to me uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I always thought you needed two people, but no, you don't. You just need you and another version of you from, yeah. Um, okay, Lux, that, that has been uh, fucking massively illuminating and a, a lot of fun. Um, I'd love for you to come back all the time. Uh, you know, any new project, please uh, tell me. And uh, thank you, Luxa. It's been wonderful. I will end the interview there. I think we've... Uh, I've no idea how long we've been talking. It's been too interesting. Yeah. But, okay. Well, Thank you, Luxa. Are, yeah. If people are curious about the Green Mushroom Project, definitely hit Absolutely. me up. I can get you a, to our server, check out my podcast, and uh, all that good stuff. Yeah. I'll post the links. But um, how would someone watching this video without the link get in touch with you? Sure. Email um, address, et cetera. Absolutely. You can, you can reach me at luxoccultpod at gmail.com or at luxoccultpod on Instagram. You can find the Luxacult podcast on pretty much all the podcasting apps and on YouTube. I don't have all of the episodes up, but I have some of them. You can find the rest on the other podcatchers. And I will give CV a link to my link tree that has my music and all of the other shit I'm into. It's, uh, just the, the podcast on its own is uh, really fantastic. You go into sociology, conspiracy theory, um, uh, solar what were they called again solar oh, solar punk yeah solar, solar punk. punk movement yeah i'm mostly just yeah. you know it's about looking at things that i think are interesting and i think my listeners will think are interesting through the lens of chaos magic absolutely i find them fascinating it's been an absolute pleasure luxa thank uh, you so much i've enjoyed our conversation thanks for having me I absolutely uh, my pleasure okay see you soon